Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Michael Alexander, Hi, uh, Director of SFU City Conversations. Welcome to SFU City Conversations, and in particular, welcome to the SFU Community Summit. Uh, Get a hat. Uh -huh. Nice hat. Where? Yes. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> um, we. Uh, City Conversations is presented by SFU Public Square. We want to thank our sponsors, SFU Vancouver, the Center for Dialogue, and the SFU City Program. And we want to acknowledge that this event takes place on unceded coastal, uh, the traditional Coast Salish territories of the Squamish, Musqueam, and Wat'u uh, Nations. Uh, this is a pretty, for those of you who haven't been here, I see many familiar faces, but for those of you who haven't been here before, it's a pretty formal uh, working lecture room. But we don't have speakers, and we don't have an audience at City Conversations. We have presenters, and we have participants, and you are the participants, and the whole focus of this is, is built around your participation. It's important in the democracy that, that citizens participate in public conversations. That's why we do this. Presenters are going to briefly frame the conversation, but most of the time is for your questions, your opinions, your observations, right? not just questions to them. Uh, the point is to encourage conversation. If you brought your lunch, thank you so much. It's not rude to eat your lunch at City Conversation. This is a lunchtime event. If you are tweeting, it's hashtag CityCom. And there should be a sign-up sheet around here if you are not on our mail list. To, uh, uh, to get on our mail list, we've got some really exciting events coming up. And today is particularly exciting because it is part of the Community Summit, and the topic is Metro Vancouver's Global Impact. From climate change to refugee settlement, cities around the world are tackling critical and complex global issues. Metro Vancouver's municipalities are increasingly recognized for their efforts to go beyond our region's boundaries. We were heavily represented at the large, uh, in the large Canadian uh, delegation to Habitat 3, the UN Conference on Housing and Sustainable Urban Development in Quito, Ecuador last uh, October. So what are the opportunities for Canadian cities? How are our civic leaders having an impact around the world on issues that affect us all. And we're we, they not yet having those impacts that should be. So we're really privileged today uh, to have as presenters Pamela Goldsmith. Uh, Jones is a member of Parliament for West Vancouver and Points North and the Parliamentary Secretary to the Minister of International Trade. She's the former mayor of West Vancouver. Penny Gerstein is professor. Penny Gerstein is professor and director of the School of Community and Regional Planning, SCARP, and the Center for Human uh, Settlements at UBC. Uh, and, and Vancouver City Councilor Raymond Louis is a member of the board of directors of the Federation of Canadian Municipalities and is currently acting mayor of Vancouver. Uh, joining us, uh, I think uh, Pamela Goldsmith Jones is uh, going to go first. Sure. Thank you very much. It's a, a pleasure to be here. I have degrees from SFU and UBC. Um, I think I'm just going to start with a little story of my own path because uh, it's come into being that I think cities are at the heart of Canada's foreign policy. Canada's international trade, and if you'd asked me that 30 years ago, when I was doing my master's degree at UBC, I would not have thought that, because I did my master's in local government. The hot topics then were NAFTA, the Soviet Union, Aboriginal self-government. Nobody was doing the Union of BC Municipalities and, and Community Associations. Um, and then I served locally for four terms, and two of those were as mayor of West Vancouver. What happened to all of us, I think, 
because of the fact of the Olympics, was that as mayor of a venue city, I was in Torino in 2006, and uh, Governor General Mikhail Jean changed my perspective entirely on what my role was. I had never met her before. There was nine of us senior delegates in Torino to figure out 2010. And she walked past me, and then she doubled back, and she said, I'm so sorry. And I said, what? what? She said, I didn't realize who you are. And I'm thinking, well, she's the governor general, and why didn't she know me? And I said, that's totally fine and completely understandable. And she said, no, there's four mayors here, Richmond, Vancouver, Whistler, West Vancouver, and you are Canada's ambassadors. You are the face of Canada to the world. And I was brand new, and I was battling Gordon Campbell on the Sea to Sky Highway, and all sorts of things. I hardly felt like an influential person that mattered. But she made me feel that way. And the mayor of Torino gave me the best political advice, honestly, among the best political advice I've ever had, which is don't underestimate the credibility that comes with being a mayor of your hometown and don't underestimate the powerful forces that will be coming at you to extort money, to exert power. And that happened. The IOC, NBC, even Van Ock. Um, but he made me feel like you can stand your ground and you can be who you need to be for your community and your country. And then the Olympics happened. And honestly, mayors were put in a role completely out of the control of the provincial government or even the federal government because this was taking place here at home. And so that really had a profound impact on me. Um, you can go to Europe with your little business card that says you're the mayor of somewhere and doors open. And I'm not sure if we realize our potential in that way through our locally elected representatives. Canada, of course, has an incredible um, reputation in the world, and of course I'm proud of our government. It makes good decisions and decisions some people don't like, but there is no question. Canada in the world today is more than welcome, and doors are opening, and it's up to us to walk through those doors in the best way that we can. So being elected 15 months ago and being appointed at the time Parliamentary Secretary for Foreign Affairs, I said to the Prime Minister, you know, I know local communities, community activism, grassroots things, foreign affairs, that, and even people would say to me, it's a little bit of a leap. <laughs> and he said, you know, you have been involved in community engagement your whole life. You've organized at the community level your whole life. You've had an abiding interest, respect, and regard for First Nations your whole life, and I can talk about that later. And that's what the role, that's the face of Canada to the world that we need. So we're, it's really about, I think, community and country. I think that that's when you see people at their most aspirational. And then a few weeks ago, I was appointed Minister, uh, Parliamentary Secretary in International Trade, which is still in the global affairs picture. And on that front, we've just passed the Canada-EU Trade Agreement. And my job will be to go from city to city to city across the country talking about the opportunities we have working as an exporting nation with Europe. The next piece will be our interest in the Asia Pacific region, which of course is second nature to those of us who live here, but that's a, a new key priority for our country, and it starts from here. And just to finish briefly, um, in terms of, of Vancouver as a, as a maritime investment hub, not shipping, this, let's just say for the sake of argument, our shipping activity stays the same. Attracting the high level, high value, high paying jobs in accounting, law, logistics that go with the shipping industry is something that Vancouver is uniquely well positioned to do and is coming into its own in that regard. So I would say, in terms of Vancouver's role in the world, I think we have yet to realize our full potential. I think that the uh, federal government is very much a facilitator in this regard, and that our local leaders, our local businesses, have um, uh, some, they couldn't really have more credibility. And um, I'd like to return to the question of the opportunity for indigenous people. Um, later, but I didn't want to. I didn't want to have the card back. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
Louie? You're on. As you can put however you can. Can people hear okay? Yeah. yeah. I'll sit there. Um, I also want to start by recognizing that we are gathered today on the homelands of uh, the unceded homelands of the Swamish Muskie and the State of Wealth, to its people, and uh, we're pleased to have this opportunity to conduct this conversation. Um, uh, after Pam's uh, comments about being mayor, I just want to say that I'm the acting mayor of the city of Vancouver, just to add that title back into the equation, because it might open a few doors. <laughs> um, but so that's it's. It's really uh, inconsequential to this conversation. Uh, but the reason why I'm here today is because Metro Vancouver as a region was invited to say a few words about uh, what our place within the world is and what influence we have uh, in the world, in, uh, more locally, and uh, in, in, our, in our nation as, as well. I brought a few uh, pictures uh, to liven up the, uh, the conversation. They're not text uh, rich, so they're just for you to, to enjoy as you hear me uh, speak about a few things. Um, just for context, much of Vancouver is the cities that uh, surround Vancouver and, uh, or, and represents over half the population of British Columbia. Uh, currently, uh, the model of urbanization is, that's happening around the world is that there's a projection that urban centers will uh, be constituted about two-thirds of the world's population by 2050. Uh, but the context here in British Columbia is that uh, we already represent about 86% of the population uh, uh, in urban centers in British Columbia. So we're, we're there already. And this is part of the reason why I think Metro Vancouver is a thought leader in uh, providing, I think, some guidance, some advice to what happens elsewhere in the world since, since we are already constrained in the Metro Vancouver area by, by mountains and water. How do we get along? How do we go about uh, um, sustaining ourselves and, in fact, not just sustain, but improve the quality of life of people that live within our region. So uh, today, my talk is a little bit about um, what we do, and I'll just go through a few slides. Uh, so I'll give you a little bit about uh, who we are. Uh, we are active in the international arena because we have a story to tell. But, but not just uh, what the stories that we tell, but what stories that we can learn and lessons that we can learn from other jurisdictions. So we've participated in the United States local government, uh, UCLG, uh, ICLE, uh, local governments for sustainability, international uh, benchmarking consortium, the World Urban Forum, and more recently, as was said, uh, we were invited to participate in Habitat 3 by Minister Duclos, who's the Minister of Housing. Uh, for the uh, federal liberal government. So, let's move to slide three. Anyway. So, Metro Vancouver engages, as I said, nationally, internationally, uh, with a number of different um, organizations on a, a number of different uh, issues. Uh, regional planning is one of the things that uh, we're most proud of, that we've been able to put together a regional government that uh, is a federation of regional governments, or federation of local governments, that cooperate on a number of different things. Regional planning is one of them. Uh, water, solid waste, liquid waste is the other major components of, of uh, Metro Vancouver. The regional planning uh, uh, document that we have adopted is uh, Metro 2040, and it's been, uh, a, I think, a guiding document for many other regions around the world. Uh, the Philippines, for instance, the region of Cebu, uh, Greater Sydney Commission, uh, are, have looked at this, the Nepotis uh, Foundation, uh, used the Metro 2040 document as an example for others. <clears throat> Next slide. Uh, our, regional, our, our regional waste management, uh, we knew that we couldn't just deal with what we were doing within the region, but rather we wanted to change this uh, the concept of purchasing a good, using it to its capacity, and then throwing it away. And so we were, we were um, at the forefront, I think, within Canada are creating a National Zero Waste Council which talked about uh, full life cycle uh, costs of that type of, uh, of uh, process where we would not uh, be as wasteful as we currently was and so were so that we created the National Zero Waste Council that started in 2011. <clears throat> it's now the premier national organization that has uh, 81 different organizations across Canada. And this is not just local government. This is uh, people from industry, other orders of government, uh, sector experts that have come together to help us guide our waste management going forward. 
and we've exported that information that we've been able to assemble uh, out into the world as well, bringing it to um, organizations like UCLG that I spoke about earlier, and they've now uh, embedded it. This member, UCLG is the, um, uh, the organization that represents cities across the entire world, uh, urban centers, and they've embedded into their strategic long-term plan as well. Next slide. So in regards to climate change, we've participated in a number of different um, areas at Metro. Um, and you know, the question was not just for Metro as a region, but the member of municipalities within, that, uh, within the Federation. City of Vancouver is uh, uh, very active internationally on the climate change file. Uh, we uh, work very hard on our initiative for 100% renewable energy. And we participated, uh, Mayor Robertson, myself, and others went to uh, Paris to influence the COP21 uh, discussions, negotiations. This is, remember, this is the one, this is the, sign, the agreement that talked about the 1.5 degrees rise or 2% 2 degrees rise and what was sustainable, what would help the world survive. And uh, I think as a result of uh, many local governments, this is the, the meeting where we had a thousand mayors from around the world assemble to pressure their state governments to uh, sign this document to commit to make, taking action on climate change. And so there's another example of where we've been able to, I think, influence our uh, local government. Uh, let's go to slide six. Portable housing. Um, Minister Duplo uh, asked the, the uh, um, asked Metro Vancouver to join him in Quito. I sat on a panel with him uh, for about 45 minutes. And it wasn't just Minister Duplo, who's a Minister of Housing, but I sat with the Minister of Housing, uh, or the, Minister, the state, you know, it was the U.S. The U.S. state of state person for housing, and you know, of course, it's changed now. But those are types of opportunities where local government gets to tell directly to the state governments what the impacts of their investment or lack of investment, in some cases, is on local government. Um, let's go to slide seven. This is just a couple of the events that uh, we have attended, but some of them are are, are is not is not what we where we go to, but the events that we've invited to Vancouver. You'll see that TED and Habitat, ha, ha, the first Habitat was here in the city of Vancouver, 1976. TED's here now permanently, and uh, we're quite proud of that. Greenpeace started here in Vancouver, and so these these are the types of things that we've exported and imported, and give people an opportunity to. Uh, to engage with us. I'll stop there and we'll go with questions. Thank you. So, thank you. Um, so, sitting between a representative from the federal and the and municipal governments um, makes me think of this old a joke um, why did the Canadian cross the road to get to the middle? <laughs> So, um, and then this is actually uh, even more important now. I mean, I, I, I kind of, before we used to think about ca Canadians as nice and safe and sort of boring and whatever. Now, we're actually, I think, being seen in the world as the kind of rational, um, you know, a thoughtful sort of uh, people who actually understand about how do you make effective policies that can really, you know, help a large swath of people. So um, I think that that joke actually has really maybe a very different meaning, and I think it has a, uh, actually has a positive connotation now. Um, so I, uh, uh, you know, I, I think that um, the, uh, Metro Vancouver's role has really gone back for a number of years, and I'm really glad that Raymond uh, mentioned um, uh, the Habitat 76 because even, you know, and I agree that, that the Olympics and the Expo and all of these other things really did set us and, you know, and made us very well known, but Habitat 76 was a really uh, quite uh, innovative event and it really sort of demonstrated the kind of best of what uh, of what the Vancouver region could be and, and hopefully, you know, I mean, parts of it are now becoming, some of them are not as, as so some of them are not great, uh, but uh, what we had then was um, we had a really engaged um, citizenry who, who actually developed the Habitat Forum, which was at Jericho Beach, and that was, you know, citizen labor and, and you know, people all the way up from, from you know, uh, high school students and uh, to, uh, to adults sort of being involved. And we welcomed the, the, the most uh, sort of cutting edge thinkers in the world at that time. And it became a really important, I think, 
a marker of, of you know, thinking about city, about Vancouver and its region as a city, because, or as a, as a, as you know, an entity. Because before that, we were fairly a backwater. I mean, I actually moved here in 1972, but you know, it was a very provincial kind of city. And slowly, we've actually begun to sort of see ourselves in sort of more positive terms. You know, fast forward to to um, you know the, uh, now, um, what we're having is we're almost a victim of our success because we are in all the indicators, the Mercy um, a, a census on on you know employment, uh, you know good places for employees to be to be located, all these kinds of things. We're rated very very highly, one of you know the top three in the world uh, for affordability. We're the, you know, way down. I mean, we're one of the most least affordable in the world. And, you know, a part of that has been because of some of the things that we've actually done that, to make it a very livable city that, that people want to, to, to go to. So um, now I think there's a real opportunity to be thinking of um, Vancouver, not just as Vancouver as a city, but as a region, because a lot of uh, the kinds of of issues that we've had in Vancouver have now sort of gone out to the region, and they don't have, um, you know, they really need the support on how to sort of address those. I was just at a, a quite amazing forum, a, a forum like this in Langley City on Tuesday night, um, where they're starting to have kind of city conversations. Um, these are uh, four uh, councillors from four different municipalities are, who are sort of organizing. And I think that it's those kinds of, 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 of things that we really need to be supporting. Um, but, uh, you know, I, the, the larger issues of, what, of how we actually have to address <coughs> and be in the world, I think, is, is you know, something that, that um, as Raymond said, we are known very, very highly. And I think we really should be setting a, a marker for that. I mean, we, you know, for the good things, not necessarily the bad things, the, the poverty, the, all, of the, all of those other things. But one of the things that I, I do think that, that Canadian cities can really demonstrate is, is how to actually make good cities. We, ha we have that skill. We have, we have been able to make good cities all across Canada. Vancouver is, you know, happens to be a really good city just you know, because of its location and all that. But we also make good cities in other places where there, where there is, you know, opportunities for, for work. There is opportunities for people to be, to be living good lives. And, you know, that isn't the case in all, in all places in the world and if you, if you go places. So, I mean, this is, you know, one thing that I think that we should be justifiably proud of in terms of Canada. And I think we should be, be trying to kind of distill what is those good, you know, what does make us good and how can we actually even get, get better at that. And so at Quito, um, you know, uh, I think that um, this is the Quito, the Habitat 3 conference, and I actually also attended um, with uh, 15 of my students, and this really reflects the Canadian government um, because they actually made the students, uh, you know, the students and I, we were all uh, uh, delegates, Canadian delegates, and so we were allowed to go into all of the, the briefings and all that sort of thing, and everybody else in the world was like amazed that, we could, that the Canadian government sort of gave us that, that opportunity. Um, but I, you know, I think that um, in, at, in the Habitat 3, um, what actually demonstrated, I think, the, the, that came out of that was a ratification of what's called the New Urban Agenda. Um, and I think, and um, Canada was involved in this. Uh, it was it was late to coming involved, but it, uh, when the new government changed uh, uh, federally, it was very actively involved in terms of getting wording that really reflected a new way of looking at cities. Um, and I think that that that's kind of a really important step. Um, people are saying, well, you know, how do you move? something like a new urban agenda into um, having it um, realized in, uh, you know, in countries. And it has to be at the city level where that's done. And that's one of the things that you know, I would like to put a challenge to the, <laughs> to the city of Vancouver to be really looking at the new urban agenda and how they could actually be including some of the things that were, were in that you know, to, ref uh, uh, to actually 
um, be again a model of what of what is possible. So. whether they're bilateral or multilateral with countries in the Asia region. So it's a different footing than how it started out. But this is CETA, this is TISA. No, but I'm, I'm, what I'm saying is that is, a, that is a set of negotiations that has now been finished as a result of the conversations I was just telling you, which will, have to, which will apply to TISA, which we'll be having to have. But we're not talking about it. And well, what I would say is that the FCM, Federation Game Spellings, which I was the immediate past president of, uh, uh, did survey. We are having this conversation, uh, both uh, with uh, TPP, CEDA, and on any agreement going forward. We had adopted as the national organization representing 2,000 cities across the, the country, seven principles of engagement that we had advanced to the last government, and they stand as policy of the FCM today. And so I got them, I don't know whether we don't have enough time to go through each, each one of them, but they are meant to protect uh, local authority uh, while recognizing that we work within the context of the National uh, Confederation of Canada, and so it's, uh, it's meant for us to ensured local choice, uh, local procurement uh, to a threshold is protected. And we, we've communicated that with previous government. In fact, uh, we, uh, Minister Freeland came to Vancouver and spoke to us uh, prior to a change in, in ministry and had a good conversation with us and we expressed our concerns to her. Uh, both Mayor, Mayor Robertson and I, Mayor Robertson at the time was the chair of the City Mayor's Caucus and I was the president of the FCM when we had a one-on-one -on -one meeting 
uh, with her and in fact had some conversations with the Prime Minister. So they're, they're aware of our concerns and we'll, hopefully that will guide the, uh, the signing of any other future agreements. Certainly have been in that um, handy in the trade. We did check the Federation's website looking for TISA. A follow up? Uh, uh, we can, where's Marjan? Yeah, I'll, any follow up to that or another question? Another question. Another question. Yes, sir. So last night on the National Day featured uh, a very interesting fact that innovation has eliminated many jobs and they took the banking industry as an example where 600 jobs were eliminated <coughs> and it was all done by new technology and it was computers and innovation took over. My question to all three of you is, what is Canada doing to meet this challenge? Now, I have visited many countries where innovation is in the forefront. I, as a proud Canadian, I'm very disappointed that we have not taken the lead in innovation. We depend on uh, exporting natural resources, oil, fossil fuels, and so on, but very little is done for innovation. So what are we going to do about it? We have a challenge. I, I, I really do agree with you. I, I think that that's been something that's really been uh, a, a missing. I mean, I don't think that we have really used our, uh, the kinds of, of, of workforce that we have in really, in, in ways that we, we should be using them. Um, and, you know, this is very interesting because we actually had a discussion in this at the um, uh, heads and directors meeting of uh, the fact of applied science at UBC, which is what our school's part of, and that's engineering. And this is what they're really pushing for in terms of trying to get an innovation strategy um, that the provincial government would, would sign on to. And that, that's actually, you know, we're, UBC's trying to do this. They're trying to develop a strategy, but you need the support of all of all those as a government. But, I mean, that's, you know, definitely the innovation should be coming at, you know, starting with the university level, starting with all of the ways that, you know, we do it. We do have, you know, startups, we do have some ideas, but then they seem to go and, and you know, they get bought out by, by, it, by U.S. firms and that kind of, and it leaves. I mean, the workforce leaves, the, the momentum leaves. I mean, it's, it's, it's yeah, it is, a, it is a real lack in Canada. <laughs> Well, it's a huge issue. Yes. I want to. I want to take that up. Please this do. is a dialogue, Good. and I'm going to. And I'm going to put it over to our panelists as well. It seems to me that in Vancouver there has been a different kind of economic development strategy uh, that is focused in on green economy, the creative economy, and if we look at the diversification of our economic system. You look at the urban centers and what's been happening in Vancouver, for example, and the new jobs and the creation is really driving our growth in this in this region. We are not the resource-based economy that our provincial government might wish us to believe we are. We are very much a diversified, knowledge-based economy with, yes, some focus on transportation and warehousing. So part of the thing is what are cities doing to communicate that different kind of economy that you're pursuing, and I'm going to look to Acting Mayor Lurie to tell us what Vancouver has done in the international arena to advance its market, its competitive advantage on innovation and diversity, and what is, and this is to over to our new parliamentary secretary on international trade, <coughs> what are you doing as a parliamentary secretary, as international trade, to position our cities as important centers for innovation, and particularly in these fields of green economy and renewable energy? Well, most of my answer to the original question is taken up by your question. I think you described well where Vancouver has been trying to focus um, our energies to move away from the uh, older, more historical economies of resource-based in British Columbia. Uh, the, late, the latest uh, data is that we're creating uh, for many, many more jobs um, than uh, to the uh, innovative economy, creative economy in Vancouver than is being created in the other industries. So what we do mostly at the city level is land use planning. And so we facilitate the, the incubation and the space necessary for these types of startups to occur. 
uh, we're attracting uh, new talent uh, and trying to create a, a center of excellence in regards to that innovative uh, economy in the city of Vancouver, but not just in the city of Vancouver, but region-wide as well. We've got our prosperity uh, initiative at the regional level, which uh, Chair Rick Moore, who's the mayor of Port Coquitlam, is, is leading up as well to try to get the rest of the region involved, because it can't just all be about the city of Vancouver. I remember when I said that it's 2.4 million people, 2.5 million people within the region. We see us all co cooperating together. And so the question was, how are we um, advancing the competitive advantage of Vancouver? I think it's advancing the competitive advantage of Metro Vancouver, because there's things that we just can't do in the city of Vancouver. We don't have the land base that other, other cities might have within the region. But we can, because we're in such tight quarters, we can work with each other to, to find that symbiotic relationship where they might have central offices here or they, we provide the support services for one component of their business and they provide the bulk of the, of the uh, larger uh, production space perhaps in another jurisdiction. Um, the world looks to Metro Vancouver and Vancouver as, as uh, a thought leader, I think, and as a result of that and our, because of our reputation, we get investment. Uh, you know, there wasn't so long ago where you know Mayor Robinson came up with the, the idea to become the greenest city in the world, and it became a competition. Because frankly, that's what it is. Vancouver is in competition with every other city around the world to attract capital, attract the best and brightest minds, and move into this new economy that the gentleman was was um, trying to advance as a, as a positive pathway forward. So, um, in order to do that, we are speaking through these other cities when we go to these events to highlight what we're doing. There are people that want to um, engage, but they don't know where to engage. They have resources, but they don't know where to invest. And if we can show them what we have, that we already have a built foundation, and that's what we've been building over these past seven years now, about the, the safe environment for them to invest, where it's stable, the, the economy's well, the capital's uh, available, and the, the government uh, is, is relatively stable, then they'll come. And that's, I think, our, our competitive advantage, aside from the water, the mountains, our free health care, almost free. Uh, I'd just like to congratulate the leadership of Rural Council on attracting companies like Microsoft. Um, why a company like that would invest here has everything to do with our incredible universities. Our government has put unprecedented investment into research in universities in the last budget and that will, that will continue. Um, in Canada, over the last decade, our investment in innovation has fallen, according to the OECD, from like 5th or 6th to 14th. So 10, is it 10 now? No, it's four. even lower. It's even lower than 14, so I'm, I'm out of date. But So there's no question. We're behind the eight ball. The minister in most demand in Canada today is Matthew Baines, who is the one that is the sort of where we go to talk about innovation, science, technology, small business. Um, Vancouver, from a video gaming, artificial intelligence, um, um, animation, 3D technology perspective, is incredible. And as it starts to build, the, the, growth, the, the growth and the interest and the investment becomes exponential. And it's quite remarkable what is being designed and explored as a result. Companies right here that don't need to actually have a Volvo go down a, a, a road fast and crash. It's all done in 3D technology now. It's incredible. But that, that's happening here. Um, we do have an issue with regard to risk-averse investors in Canada. We, we do get stuck at the small size of companies and they tend to go to the US where people are more willing to risk their money and that's something perhaps we as a culture and a, and a banking system need to need to look at. But I think there's uh, quite a bit of, of hope for the future and as innovation eliminates certain kinds of jobs, it is absolutely creating a whole another kind. I mean, I think I, I think I, I think it's, there's positive signs, but I do think that it is worrying that you know, as much you alluded to, is that you know to realize how much we're intertwined with the U.S. and when and when U.S. policies go in directions that are really contrary to what uh, we need to be going to in terms of our own sovereignty, 
um, you know, that we don't have a strategy to be addressing that at, at a national level and at a provincial level. I think that's, so, a, that's a new yeah. topic which would be kind yes. of discussed, but yeah. on innovation? No, no, that's about innovation. Oh, yeah. So, I'm hearing two things here. One is that Canadians cross the road to get to the middle, <laughs> but that Canadians are risk adverse and therefore get businesses going but when they get to a certain size where where money more money needs to come in to to make them international successes instead we say no that that's too risky and they wind up going to the US which is which is uh, less risk adverse is that, is that, I don't know if that's true I don't think that's accurate. I think Vancouver. Well, that's what I was hearing. Yeah. Hearing, but uh, oh, great. You're going to disagree. I disagree. I disagree. Vancouver <laughs> has the highest density of entrepreneurs anywhere in the country. In fact, in all of North America, the highest density of entrepreneurs, and uh, that's a lot of that is centered around innovation as well. We have a number of startup, number of startup uh, opportunities here, and we're facilitating that as a city, and that's why. You know, corporations, as Pam was saying, Microsoft is coming into town and Hootsuite is staying in town and others are, are, are centering here because we have that, uh, that clustering of that level of innovation. So, you know, it's not as if they, they just uh, all get bought out. Some of them are growing to uh, such a scale where they are wanting to, to, to stay in the city of Vancouver, despite being global leaders themselves. Yeah, yeah, but the majority of the of the entrepreneurs are actually, you know, wanting, you know, self-employed employment. That's what that's what it is. is, is people doing consulting, doing other sure. things, and they don't grow. It isn't growing to a scale where you can you can increase employment and that, you know, and, and and grow, you know, and and I mean, and that's actually BC wide. I mean, we're that's what we, you know, is predominantly very small businesses. That we're, that we're creating here. I mean, yes, we, we have the Hoot Suites, we have, but we don't have very many. I mean, the largest employer in the city of Vancouver, and it's not in the city of Vancouver, is UBC. So, you know, it's, it's in a totally different district. And so, I mean, that's not, you know, that's not great to have a, you know, to have a city that has so little major employment. Any other, other, Comments on this thing? <laughs> on this thing? Yes? Yes. yes. Over there. Uh, is it time to develop a national urban strategy to drive economics in the country? Uh, I would think that such a strategy would really give focus to the infrastructure investments right now, which seem to lack a focal point. Um, and if not, is it time to think about a new uh, form of federalism, a federalism 2.0 that involves more responsibility to the city? It seems to me that we have to look at you know, some serious options here uh, rather than just continue along with the same um, incremental approach. So, so the best the, the best time in terms of uh, municipal or uh, urban um, sort of development and some, some of the more rational and exciting decisions that were made was when the federal government had a Ministry of Urban Affairs. And that's when you got False Creek, that's when you got the Breton Flats, that's when you got St. Lawrence. Uh, you know, in, in Toronto, I mean, these large-scale developments that were really innovative models that set a direction for the rest of the city. Um, the reason that ended, it was very short-lived, was because of inter, uh, you know, pro, inter well, provincial sort of wrangling that, you know, that they, um, well, maybe actually Quebec, <laughs> who wanted to, you know, go it alone in terms of, of municipal affairs. Um, and so, you know, I still think that that's what's needed. Yes, we have a minister of infrastructure, but I really think we need a minister that deals with urban issues. I mean, 90% of our population is in urban areas, 100 miles from the, from the U.S. I mean, this is like, you know, we really need to be addressing these issues. Not saying that urban issues, I mean, rural issues are not, not needed to be addressed. Yes, I mean, they're critical. There's huge, there's huge issues there in terms of infrastructure, poverty, all sorts of things. But, but the fact that we don't have one, and we haven't had one since the 1970s, I think is really a detriment right now. Sentiment about that? See hands? Yeah. Who, what do people think about the, uh, the idea of having a ministry of urban affairs in Canada? We're going to be Canadian. Yeah. Well, yeah. Our hand, yeah? yeah. Okay. 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 Well, 
So there's no doubt, uh, I would agree with what Pam has said, there's no doubt it's gotten better. Um, <coughs> it does rise and fall based on who is elected both federally and provincially. You know, we're on the precipice of a, of a provincial election and uh, local government, which is a creature of provincial law. All, our, all of our authority is derived from what is allotted to us or allocated to us at a provincial level. And we do the work that we do on eight cents of every tax dollar. You might have heard this figure before. It fluctuates between eight and ten cents. Fifty percent goes to the federal government, forty percent goes to the provincial government, and local government provides you with sewer, water, solid waste, police, fire, libraries, community centers, parks, roads, land use planning, we chase after dogs that are running free. You know, these are the types of things that we provide to you on eight cents. So from our standpoint, to your question, on the infrastructure part. That's why we worked so hard to the FCM uh, uh, in order to convince uh, as many parties as we could, including the current government, that a further investment on long-term stable funding was necessary to rebuild that infrastructure that is so important for urban centers. Most of that investment was done many, many years ago and was at the end of life. It needs refurbishment, not just because we need to replace the services, but there's new technologies, new innovations that uh, we can uh, bring into play. But it really does come down to, I think, the question of should we leave it to the, to the outcome of an election to determine whether or not we get the proper investment or not? Our political system would indicate it hasn't happened sufficiently uh, because the vote distribution, the way that our country is constructed, our province is constructed, where is the vote? And so the urban centers is disproportionately disadvantaged in terms of your vote power in terms, of, in terms of where your investment is. This is something that we at Metro Vancouver will be highlighting over this next uh, number of weeks at a provincial level on where your tax dollars go, whether it's your homeowner grant, whether it's school tax, whether it's your property transfer tax. Where is that money going? It's leaving the Metro Vancouver area. So when you say urban, that's great. I, I, I'm with you. But it really does come down to you know, the, the big change. And are we ready for it? Last time we did Leech Lake, I think that was a little controversial, and uh, people, I don't know, were, were ready to revisit that, which is, you know, un un unfortunate, because when I, I've been to Botswana, I had a good chat with their MPs, and they're amending their constitution on a fairly regular basis, when they, because they're really new, uh, they don't see a problem with revisiting how they govern themselves, because they see, here's a failing, let's fix it, and move on to, uh, you know, trying to implement to, to improve the quality of life of our residents and citizens. Mm -hmm. Sir, can I have a follow-up? Oh, 
Go to hand over here first, please. Okay, thank you. Oh yeah, so uh, so I think Vancouver uh, being um, such a unique place, being so close to Asian Pacific, and last night we have uh, you know a uh, discussion about uh, China and Canada uh, cultural diplomacy, right? So you know because uh, I'm, I'm from China, I see a lot of uh, international trade and cultural exchange and international students uh, coming from China and studying in, in Vancouver, Canada, and also. Um, you know, and also international trade going on, right? And and there's a lot of uh, you know um, investment from China. You know, immigrants coming from China, and and also I see there's local uh, residents because of the uh, housing crisis, right? So um, the local uh, residents couldn't afford uh, the young families, right? Couldn't afford the house, and they have to move out of uh, Metro Vancouver. So you know, but the, the new immigrants they also they also see Vancouver as a you know a land opportunity, right? They they open a new business here. So um, yeah, and also uh, what 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 does the uh, Vancouver uh, uh, play a role on the international stage, being so close to China, and also being pretty close to you know Seattle, United States? Uh, yeah, thanks. It plays an incredibly important role. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's been an interesting experience to come from a place like this where that is self-evident mm -hmm. and then work in Ottawa with a very strong orientation, I would say, <coughs> to the Atlantic and the transatlantic trade in, in Europe. But this is going to be more and more and more um, where, where our focus lies. For Canadians, in terms of a bilateral trade agreement with China, that goes hand in hand with um, conversations with China and holding China to account on human rights, for instance. This is not just a, a, a we only pick and choose certain things, we're in this together. But we very, very much feel that that comes through dialogue and through uh, uh, rigor and regard for one another and our differences and where we can work together in complete contrast to the previous government that had a very capricious, I think, contradictory, hot and cold attitude toward China. That's certainly not the approach that we are taking. Yes, ma'am. Yes. Um, I concern right now is about climate change and the fact that in, in the states we have the government that uh, has appointed a head of the Environmental Protection Agency that doesn't even believe in the Environmental Protection Agency that he's supposed to govern and so I really appreciate what the federal government has done in terms of taking up the slot on the global gag rule with respect to abortion services for girls and women overseas to ensure just like other countries like Netherlands want to basically put funding into that to basically quote unquote take up the slot. If, they, if the U.S. aren't going to do it, then other governments have to kind of help. So my question is, knowing that there isn't a real belief in climate change there, and that there isn't a federal commitment. I think you will see certain centers in the U.S. continue with their plans. I really do. Uh, certainly uh, for our government, it's important. Uh, you know, we, we made a splash, uh, obviously, on the international scene a day after being elected. Uh, and we've made decisions as well with regard to uh, cancelling Enbridge and a tanker ban on the North Coast, but also giving permission to Kinder Morgan. That, we see that as a, a way to get from to a low carbon economy. The GHG emissions in the Kinder Morgan pipeline, which I know is hugely controversial here, it's less controversial, unfortunately, for here and elsewhere in the country. But that's calculated into our COP21 commitments. Minister McKenna stands up in the House of Commons every single day to an onslaught of opposition to this. So it's important to bear in mind that, that there is a strong opposition and you'll see this coming out in the, uh, with the exception of one candidate for the Conservative leadership. They, they may go in that direction as well. So this is going to be a real test for us, especially in the context of new leadership in the U.S. But we believe we are in line with most other Western democracies, if not all. Um, and you'd be surprised and I think encouraged to know the requests our Prime Minister gets from other countries, other like-minded countries, to be the liaison with the U.S., to, to be the go-between. Um, and and it, it, it's quite surprising because, of course, the United States has had excellent relationships 
with Western democracies, let alone other countries. And that seems to be um, uh, not fully, well, nobody really fully understands where we're going, but Canada is seen as a country well positioned to be first and to get it right. So from a, from a city perspective, um, we, of course, support the federal government's movement in that direction. Not fully, of course, from the city, city of Vancouver standpoint, in regards to the approval of the pipeline, uh, but that's, uh, as Pam said, it's really close to home for us and affects us, and therefore we have an opposition at, at Vancouver City Council to that. Um, the other components of pieces of it, the carbon tax uh, national strategy, I think the government should be congratulated on that, because it's as Pam was describing, that there are many voices that are opposed, and you know, much ridicule for the one conservative leadership candidate that uh, is speaking, uh, perhaps is mine. But rather than debating on these global climate change charters, uh, what the cities are, do are doing is that we're trying to implement, and that's what, exactly what the city of Vancouver is doing. Uh, unfortunately, though, uh, in some instances, we need authority, and uh, we need authorities from uh, the provincial government in order to give us the tools necessary to implement. It's, it's hard for change sometimes, uh, but we are implementing and showing through example two other local governments that, and a coalition of local governments. This is why we have uh, UCLG. This is why we have our, our coalition of 100% renewable energy um, cities around the world that have signed on to try to get to 100% uh, renewable energy to move away from the, uh, the historical pathways. And by showing them both our successes and our failures, and uh, testing them in different uh, arenas, we can we can then get other cities. And so hopefully, what happens is that the the voters themselves, the voters that vote not just locally, but vote provincially and vote or state level and, and uh, federally, um, will also push those people to adopt similar practices based on experience. That we have a real example. They did it. Why can't we do it elsewhere? And, how do we resource those other jurisdictions if they say they don't have the resources? Local well, government, despite having very little resources, tries to make do and prioritizes in a different way. And that's why we hope uh, both the provincial governments and the federal government does as well. Yeah, Alberta has a price on carbon. And that, I think that matters. <coughs> I think that's exciting. And it not, can't be easy to be rich and not be right. Yes, sir. Very, very yeah. quick. We've got one minute left. Mm -hmm. Very quickly. I hope that there is a time now to start neighborhood internet providers and soften up with the palace bell and shawl. I, I had to take some of them to court, but it was, it was necessary. I made a police report and they settled. Okay. So <coughs> Coquitlam and many Canadian cities are already trying to have uh, Modern, basic infrastructure. Modern internet, yeah. but it was like. I think Vancouver was actually had a proposal on that, didn't they? Fiber, yes, yeah, she did, and it just died. But yeah. My fiber optics, not a strong Wi-Fi, yeah. and I hope the, the time has come. The time actually has come. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but I want to thank our presenters, and I hope you'll uh, join me. In a spirited discussion. We have some gifts for each of you. Honey from you want, guess where? In Vancouver, from Ives from uh, from humanity. Oh, great! Uh, because the which. Generates so the best money. <laughs> Thank you all. Our next event is March 16th, uh, Thursday, March 16th, two weeks from today. We're working uh, very hard on it, and we think that, uh, uh, I, I think I can say now the conversation is going to be about development in Chinatown, what kind of development should take place, what kind of preservation should uh, take place. Hot topic, uh, and, uh, and uh, we've got one presenter still to be confirmed, but, uh, but we think that that's going to be it. So thank you all for joining us. Thank you for uh, coming to City Conversations. Thank you for participating in 
this wonderful week of uh, community engagement uh, at, at SFU. And we'll see you, I hope, in two weeks. Thank you.